Hi, this is Pastor Paul from Clear Spring Church in Gloucester, and I want to share an encouraging word with you today that I have entitled, Moving in the Gifts and Power of the Holy Spirit. If, like me, I'm sure you love the Holy Spirit and you love to read of the miraculous encounters that we see in the Word of God throughout the Gospels and especially throughout the Book of Acts. And today I just want to share with you that the Christian walk is not just a walk of theology or a walk of prayer. No, no, no. It's a living relationship with the person and the power of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. When we think all the way back to the Old Testament, we think back to Moses. He's out tending his flocks in the wilderness and all of a sudden God appears to him in the flames of fire in the burning bush. And God commissions Moses to go back to Egypt and to rescue his people, Israel. And he doesn't just send Moses empty handed. No, he sends Moses with power, with signs and wonders to show and to convince the people, as well as Pharaoh, that God has sent him. As we move forward throughout history, we see God raising up men and women, prophets and prophetesses with the power of God, especially men like Elijah and Elisha. We see the power of God coming down upon the Solomon, uh, the Temple of Solomon, as the glory of God rests upon it. And we're told that the priesthood couldn't carry out their normal duties because the power and the presence of God was so strongly upon Solomonic Temple. And then we move forward to the New Testament and we see that on the day of Pentecost, this same Shekinah glory that appeared to Moses, and this same glory and power that resided upon Solomon's temple, now falls down on the day of Pentecost upon those early disciples, those early Christians. So much so that when we come to the writings of Paul, Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God and of glory now rests upon you? And because this presence of God, because this Shekinah glory now rests upon you and upon me, we have a living walk, a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we should be seeing in our life manifestations of his grace, manifestations of his power. And not just to bless us, no, but to bless the church and to be used as signs and wonders to convince this hurting lost and dying world, that there is a risen saviour who died for them, who loves them, and who wants to save them. Now we're going to turn to a very familiar passage, and we're going to break this down step by step to see exactly what the Holy Bible has to say to you and to me about moving in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be taking it from verse 1. The Apostle Paul writing says this, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Here Paul begins chapter 12. And he wants to approach the subject of the spiritual gifts or the spiritual graces of the Holy Spirit in the church. And he begins by encouraging the church not to be ignorant about this topic. And what's really strange is that there are a few places in the Bible where God says he doesn't want us to be ignorant about things. But often those are the things that we are most, often most ignorant about. And so today I want to share this teaching with you so that we're not ignorant so that we're not misinformed about what the scripture has to say about the spiritual graces, powers and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul begins this section by saying, I don't want you misinformed. I don't want you ignorant. The only way basically you can come to Christ is through the Holy Spirit. And that's why anyone who is speaking by the Holy Spirit could never say, Jesus be cursed. And so when you hear of people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but they're, they're saying JC or OMG, they're misusing and, and cursing the name of God, then that's a fruit, or should we say that's a lack of fruit in their life that should be an alarm bell to us or a red flag. That just because somebody declares themselves to be a follower of Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that they are if they're not producing the fruit in keeping with repentance. And Paul says here that somebody who has the Holy Spirit, somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit, could never curse the name of Jesus. They could never curse the name of God. So when you hear 
other quote-unquote believers blaspheming, misusing the name of God, misusing the name of Jesus, you need to correct them, you need to rebuke them, and on many occasions you may need to lead them in, 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 in the gospel of salvation because it's unlikely they've come through to Christ if they're still misusing Christ's name or God's name because Paul says somebody with the Spirit, they cannot do this. The next thing he says is that nobody can say that Jesus is Lord unless they have the Holy Spirit. And to say that Jesus is Lord is not something flippant. My university professors, many of them were unbelievers and some of them were even atheists. Um, they could say Jesus is Lord uh, whilst teaching the scriptures, whilst teaching theology. But it doesn't mean to say they were saved. No, what Paul is talking about here is owning Jesus as Lord. And when we mean Lord, we mean King. We mean Emperor. We mean the, the final authority, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of the universe. When we say that Jesus is Lord, and we mean it from our heart that he, is, he has become my Lord, you can only do this by the power and grace and uh, miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. You see, we can only come to a saving faith if the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, of righteousness and of the coming judgment, that the Holy Spirit leads us to repentance, that he gives us the faith to trust in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we can say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And it's only by means of the Holy Spirit that anyone can be saved. And so that's good news, which means that the, the, the onus of salvation is not on us, it's on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to save us by God's grace. For we are saved by faith alone and not by any good work that we can perform. Amen. Well, let's continue reading to see what Paul uh, now has to say in 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now here, Paul approaches the topic of the Trinity. Notice here he talks about the same Lord the same Spirit, the same God. Here, Paul is referencing that God is a triune being. And one of the surefire signs that somebody is truly born again and that they own Jesus Christ as Lord is that they'll believe in a Trinitarian God. They will believe in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. They will never assign the Holy Spirit to just the power of God or they will never assign Jesus to just a prophet of God. No, no. No, no. Somebody who is truly born again, somebody who truly owns Jesus Christ as their Lord, is a Trinitarian believer. They believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one Godhead. That's what true Christianity teaches, and this is what Paul is emphasizing here. A true believer will never curse Jesus. A true believer will own Jesus Christ as Lord, and a true believer will be Trinitarian, owning God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this triune God works in the church. He works in those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's now move on to what Paul has to say next concerning the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit and he gives them to each one just as he determines. When I became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 16, I had a profound encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on my knees in my bedroom. That evening, Jesus Christ came into my room and I could feel his presence all around me. And when I asked God to forgive me of my sin and for Jesus Christ to become my Lord and Savior, I felt that divine presence that was all around me in the room come into me and instantly I was changed. My character and nature was changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. 
That's how powerful the born again experience is when you truly trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ's death, burial and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. When I cried out to God, God came into my life and he transformed me. That's the power of God. And when we talk about the power of God, we talk about transformational power. We talk about a power that can transform people from darkness to light. And that power is available to you and it's available to me. In fact, Jesus Christ has called us to be lights in this world and how impossible it would be to be a light of Jesus Christ if Christ was not living in us, if Christ had not given us his power to accomplish this mighty mission and ministry. Now, Paul begins here by saying to each one in the church, to each one, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given for the common good. Now, meditate upon those words for a while. To each one. You see, it doesn't matter whether you're a man, a woman, a child, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're black or whether you're white, whether you're young or whether you're old. The Bible says to each one in the church, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power is given. That means you. That means me. That means Joe Bloggs we sit next to on a Sunday morning. Every single person in the body of Christ who has received Jesus and is filled with the Holy Spirit, every single person the Bible says, is given a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And these manifestations are not for blessing ourselves, no. They are for blessing the church. They are for strengthening other believers. That's why later on, uh, the Apostle Paul will talk in this letter that the very foundation of the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit is love. That if we want to move in the real power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we need to first of all be operating in the love of God. Because the reason for this is when we move in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit, it's never for our benefit. It's for the benefit of other people in the church. And when the church becomes consumed with the love of God, and each person no longer looks out for their own wants and their own desires and their own needs to be filled, but they look to the needs of others. When everybody in the church is looking towards somebody else's need, then we all get blessed. Where there's selfishness, the power of God dries up. But where there is a giving, good eye attitude, the power of God overflows. It's like the jars that kept on overflowing with oil. So long as there's another jar, it'll keep overflowing. And so long as we are brimming over with love, the power of God will keep on flowing. The moment we use or we try and use the power of the gifts of God for our own selfish gain, or for our own ego, or for our own pride, or for our own ministerial kind of uh, elitism, or whatever you want to call it, it will dry up. And that's often when ministers turn to fakery, or charlatanism, or anything like that. It's because the real power of God has dried up. And we should never be seeking to promote ourselves, or to promote our ministry, or to promote our name. We need to promote Jesus Christ. Let God promote you. Amen? And the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit are not for self-promotion. They're not a badge of honor. They're not a certificate of approval. They're not a medal to say that we've arrived. The gifts and the power of God are not for our benefit. They are for the benefit of other people in the church. And they are for the benefit of those who are not saved yet. To serve as signs and as wonders. To get them to think, to snap them out of their hypnotism and to open their eyes to see what reality is truly like. This is why the power of God is given. This is why the spiritual gifts are given to those who eagerly desire after them. Now, when I first became a believer at the age of 16, I joined a Pentecostal church. And when I did, I turned up at that church and everybody around me was speaking in other tongues. And I thought, what on earth have I got myself into here? I was really, really Freaked out by it. I was really scared by everyone speaking in tongues. I didn't understand it. Uh, I'd only just come to know God and Jesus Christ. I didn't know the Bible. I'd never really been to church before, maybe a few times when I was younger, but that was more of a kind of a, a funeral or a church, uh, a Christmas church service. I never actually attended a real church service before. And so I was stood there and people were singing the, the latest contemporary songs and then people started speaking and shouting in other tongues and I was really weirded out by this. I was freaked out. I thought, 
I don't know if I want to come back to church again. What, is, what have I got myself into here? And if it wasn't for the wisdom of uh, the youth leader who was there, he looked over, he saw that I was a new person and he realized I was getting freaked out by this weird babbling and noise. He came over to me, opened the scriptures and said, hey, listen, I know this sounds weird, but look at Mark 16. And then he turned to Acts chapter two. He said, there you go, Acts chapter two. Then he turned to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14. And he showed me all the various places in the New Testament where true followers of Jesus Christ began speaking in other tongues. Now, that's not to say that every believer will speak in tongues. The Bible is clear on that. The Holy Bible says we have all been baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. We've all been given the one spirit to drink. And then later Paul will say, but do all speak in tongues? And I think the obvious answer to that is no. So every one of us who's a true Christian, a follower of Jesus, we've all received the Holy Spirit. We've all been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but not all of us will speak in tongues. And that's fine because that's the way the Holy Spirit wants it to be. But on that occasion, the youth minister taught me from the scriptures that speaking in tongues is biblical. It is scriptural. And so I thought to myself, well, if Jesus has given me salvation and if God has come into my life and there are these other people speaking in other tongues, then I want to speak in tongues too. I mean, if God has given them a gift, why won't God give me a gift? And so I set my heart to pray for the gift of tongues. And I prayed fervently, hours a day sometimes, praying for tongues. And first week went by, nothing happened. Second week, third week, fourth week, I was getting a little bit frustrated by by the fourth week, why is nothing happening? And then I saw in the Bible that sometimes people had hands laid upon them and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues. So I began to seek out Christians in my church. I began to approach the elders and the ministers to lay hands upon me so that I could speak in tongues and nothing happened. And the second month went by and the third month went by and the fourth month went by. But if you know me, I've got this kind of chutzpah attitude. I've got this dogged determination that never gives up until I get what I want. I'm like a dog with a bone. And I'm like, no, four, four months in, God, why haven't you given me it yet? Everyone else is speaking in tongues. Why aren't I? And it wasn't happening for me. And I got to the fifth month. And then in the sixth month, um, I was invited to go away uh, to a Christian retreat in Wales at a place called Kethan Lee. And whilst I was there, the, the minister that was there was a, a, a young South African man. And he preached an excellent message on the power of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he said, those of you who want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and those of you who want to speak in tongues and move in the gifts of the Spirit, I want you to come forward right now. Oh, my heart burned within me. I thought, yes, Lord, may this be the time. And as I walked forward towards that young South African minister, my heart began to well up inside of me. I felt something was happening and something was changing. As I stood before him, he simply laid hands upon me in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, I felt the lightnings of heaven flash through me. And I felt this welling up, this, this, this rising up of this spiritual pressure and energy on the inside of me until it came up through my chest, up through my throat. And all of a sudden, bam, out of my mouth came the tongues. And up until that point, I had tried learning tongues. I had tried practicing tongues. I had tried just making silly sounds. Um, I tried to get every book on the topic that I could find, watch every program I could get, read as much of the, I tried everything to speak in tongues and nothing would work, nothing would happen. And I couldn't fake it. But then on that day, when he laid hands upon me, the power of God went through me and it exploded through me. And it was such an amazing and wonderful experience. And not only was I filled with the Holy Spirit and not only did I speak in tongues at that time, but I was also filled with more confidence and boldness. So much so that later that evening, I was able to stand before a huge crowd of people and share that testimony, something I wouldn't have been able to do prior to that experience. I'd have been too nervous, too shy. But now I was filled with this confidence and holy boldness from God. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, throughout the last 2000 years, the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been manifesting in the church. Um, but kind of throughout the Middle Ages, they, they tended to kind of die off. And it wasn't until around about 1904, actually in South Wales, with Evan Roberts, did the spiritual gifts really come to the forefront again. It was during the Welsh revival of 1904, not so much that speaking in tongues came to the forefront, but the gift of prophecy words of wisdom, words of knowledge, visions and dreams were being reported. 
And this was growing and growing and growing in South Wales, so much so that uh, some ministers from America heard the reports, they came on over, they saw the power of God, uh, the, the, the miracles of God, even healings were occurring in South Wales during that time, that they went back to America, reported it there, and people in America really began to seek God and pray to God for the filling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and it began to break out there too. So the history of Pentecostalism really didn't begin in America, it began in South Wales. And you could also put it a little bit further back with the Wesleys and, and Whitfield, they saw certain manifestations of power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has never left the church. The power of God has never left the church. What unfortunately has happened is that the church has stopped eagerly desiring the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we need to learn as the church is that God doesn't want to work apart from us. He wants to work with us. Now, of course, God can work apart from us, and he often does, but God's greatest desire is to have a relationship with you and to have a relationship with me and for the Holy Spirit to work through us. It's a partnership, but let's never forget that he is the major partner in this, not us. It's not our will be done, it's his will be done. Well, the Holy Bible tells us that there are various manifestations or gifts or graces of the Holy Spirit, and to one there is given the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge, to another gifts of healing, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, another discern, discerning or distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. And it says that all of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Now, we're told here that each of these manifestations, whether it be tongues and interpretation, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, faith, miraculous signs, discernment or distinguishing of spirits, whatever these manifestations are, these manifestations are not worked up by ourselves. By all means, we must eagerly desire them. We must pursue them in prayer. We must want them with all of our heart. And we must cry out to God day and night until they begin to manifest. Because unless we see the power of God move, the church will not be edified and strengthened like it should. And if it's not edified and strengthened, it will never be in a fit place to evangelize the world. You see, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the body of Christ and the edification of believers is so that the church can be strengthened to glorify Jesus Christ in this world. You see, if we're going to be bright lights, if we're going to shine like a fiery blaze for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to be a people who are strong. We need to be a people who are edified. We need to be a people who are filled with the power and the spirit of God. And that's why these grace gifts of God has been given to the church, to strengthen you, to strengthen me, to build one another up. And that's why love is so important. Because when I come to church with selfish motivation, I have come to take from you and you have come to take from me. But if we come to church with a heart attitude of love, then I have come to give to you and you have come to give to me. And when we come with that heart attitude, that, that selfless motivation that we want to bless others, then we all get something in return. We all get blessed, but we give and we receive at the same time. And that is the way of God. The way of God is not to pursue selfish gain or selfish desire. No, the way of God is to give and then God can give it back unto us. Isn't that wonderful? Now, there are nine manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul talks about uh, many of them here. And I have been really kind of blessed by God to see many of these manifestations occur in my life. I can honestly say I think I've seen all of these gifts manifested apart from one gift. And that's the gift of miracles. And this is a gift that I need to start crying out to God and pursuing God to see the gift of miracles occurring in my life and in my ministry. What is it that you want to see in your life and in your ministry? What is it right now that your church needs? Are there a lot of sick people in your church? Then maybe God is calling you to cry out to him day and night for the gifts of healing until you begin to see those sick brothers and sick sisters being restored back to health so that they can glorify God with their lives. Maybe the church is wayward, it's wandering, it's, it's departing from scripture. Maybe you need the gift of prophecy. 
Start crying out to God for the gift of prophecy that he would speak through you to edify and to strengthen and even to correct your church and to bring it back on track. Maybe you lack faith. The good news is there's a grace of faith available. Cry out to God day and night for greater faith for you and for your church, that your church would be so full of faith it would take on the, the largest of mountains and see them moved. What is it that you and your church need right now? What is it that you could write down on a prayer list and cry out to God for? I often encourage my uh, congregation to make a prayer list and to jot down five things on that prayer list and to pursue God in prayer uh, before breakfast, before lunch and before the evening meal. Before you put any food into your mouth, you spend a couple of minutes in prayer going through your prayer list. And in that way, like a good Jewish person would, you pray three times a day. You pray before breakfast, you pray before lunch, and you pray before your evening meal. And you seek God for those five things in your prayer list. Why don't you just go away now and spend a few moments with the Lord and, and meditate upon what your congregation, what your church, what your brothers and sisters in Christ, what do they really need right now? What are the five things you need to cry out to God for on their behalf? Jot them down. Make a prayer list. Go through those five things one by one by one. You don't have to spend hours going through it. No, no, just a couple of minutes before breakfast, a couple of minutes before lunch, a couple of minutes before your evening meal, and maybe a couple of minutes before you put your head down upon the pillow. It's far better that you cry out to God several times a day throughout the day than, than trying to pray for half an hour, an hour at a time and, and not being able to do that. No, break it up, chunk it up into smaller portions and cry out to God until you begin to see the manifestations and the power of God breaking out in your life. Remember Evan Roberts. He was a young 26-year-old Welsh miner. Wales was in a bad state. The church was at a low ebb. And he cried out to God day and night for years for the power of the Holy Spirit to break out in South Wales. And then on October 31st, 1904, the power of God fell within a Sunday school room and it spread and it spread all over the local area and it spread all over South Wales. And now today there are Pentecostal churches all over the world because of what that young man prayed all those years ago. Praise God for that. Maybe you could be the next Evan Roberts. Maybe you're the next John Wesley or George Whitfield. Maybe you're the next person to bring the power of God to your locality and see it spread. I hope like me you have a heart for revival. I hope like me you have a love for Jesus Christ. I hope like me you want to see the church of Jesus Christ strengthened and raised up. It is time for revival. It is time for the power of God to hit the United Kingdom again. And I ask you now to stand with me in prayer and to believe with Jesus Christ for the power of God to be let loose in the church through you and through me in Jesus' name. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. I pray this has blessed you. God bless. <laughs>